Welcome back to Konst. Konst is a podcast by Scandinavian Mind about contemporary and future art, the interconnection with society, culture, technology, finance and lifestyle. The outlook is primarily at the art world from a Scandinavian perspective, although taking into account the global arena of artists, exhibitions, trade fairs and other current events. In this very special episode, I'm super excited to have Jerry Gogoshen as a guest. She is a jet-setting blonde who loves collecting expensive blue-chip art, arbeiting her enemies at auction and working remotely from Saint-Tropez in the summer and Gstaad in the winter. So with that said, Jerry, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. So given your uh, very cosmopolitan uh, international lifestyle, where are you based when we record this? Right now I'm in New York City. Is that your hometown? I live in Los Angeles and I live in New York. So um, I kind of go back and forth, though lately uh, work, I prefer Los Angeles because of the weather um, and you can be sort of closer to nature, but uh, my, so, so much of the art world is centered here in New York City. So um, primarily my projects tend to be here, though in all honesty, I'm not really any anywhere ever for more than two weeks because as many people in the art world know, there is um, always a Biennale or an art fair somewhere on the planet happening. And because I write about the art world professionally, um, I'm constantly required to get on a plane and go wherever um, the art world is moving. Mm. So can I ask you, um, Jerry Gogoshian, so if you know the art world, you might get the, <laughs> the kind of, uh, you, you, you will get the name as well as Larry Saltz, then your, your kind of website where we can access your reports, etc. We'll come back to that. But can you um, explain to the audience that might not know, know you, you know, the listeners that are um, kind of getting to know you for the first time, why Jerry Gagosian and, you know. Yeah, mm. it actually, uh, Jerry Gagosian is a, is an Instagram handle and a character that I created about three and a half years ago. My real name is Hildy Lynn Helfenstein, but uh, I wanted to sort of merge, I thought like, you know, the, the two greatest names in the art world, the most visible, recognizable names, at least in the American art world, are uh, Jerry Saltz, the Pulitzer Prize winning art critic, and Larry Gagosian, uh, the biggest art dealer in the world. And um, so I put their names together. And um, I also thought that that would be a very easy way to sort of trick the the algorithm on Instagram <laughs> to get more people to look at my stuff. I mean, people still write me all the time and, and say like, dear Mr. Gagosian, would you please <laughs> show my art at your, at your gallery? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it actually worked a little too well in that regard. But, um, and I'm, I'm actually very friendly. Uh, I've known uh, Jerry Saltz for, uh, nine years or so. Mm. And, uh, so I, so when we, we email each other back and forth all the time, we always say like, love the other Jerry. <laughs> like, <laughs> so he very gener he very generously shares the other Jerry's, you know, the other Jerry name with me. So what about Larry? Um, Is he as generous as Jerry? I have no, I, I you know what? I have no idea. I personally don't know. Mm -hmm. So you, you never heard from uh, his lawyers or anything? <laughs> it's the U.S., right? All I can say <laughs> is that it's, it is the U.S., the most litigious place on the planet. Um, no, I would I would just say that uh, I spell it G-O-G-O. -G -O. Mm -hmm. yeah. His name is G-A-G-O-S-I-A-N, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. spell it like Go-Go. Yeah. So, um, and I'm, I write satire and I'm an artist. So I think that that sort of combination would, 
really run in conflict with definitions of what art is and what entertainment is and if um if we can't like make fun a little bit of the art world and of ourselves like then where's the fun in Mm. all of this there has to be some fun because just the money side is a little bit of a drag and (laughs) when you when you hear about the business coming in comings and goings it can get a little sort of um disheartening so Mm. try to make light of a very uh dark situation which iron is so ironic to me because i remember when i went into the art world i i went into it because i was like young and dumb and i was like i just want to be free i just want to be free mm. to do anything i want to do there's a very funny story about my life which is that in 2005, Art Basel was three years old in Mm -hmm. Miami, and I was living in Miami at the time. And uh, I heard about it. It was not what it is now. Now now Miami is a huge party. The whole city's overrun. It's kind of a nightmare to be there. There's so much. Like, everywhere you look, there's an event. There's an opening. There's a dinner. There's this. There's Mm -hmm. Uh, it was not like that back then. In 2005, it, it was just like a convention, you know, art fairs. There weren't art fairs like there are now. Um, and I remember going and uh, pulling up in my little gray Jetta and popping in, you know, 75 cents in the in the meter, which is like less than a dollar, uh, and buying a ticket for 10 bucks. And uh, before I got out of my car, I smoked a joint, which I don't do those things anymore. But at the time, I got really stoned. And I went into a um, viewing room that was exhibiting this film called Daisies by Vera Shaitilova, which is this Czech New Wave film. Um, And because I was stoned, I completely misinterpreted the entire film. (laughs) And I thought that the film was about God and the devil fighting over art on earth. And I had a spiritual experience. And when I came out of that, I decided that I was going to fight for art on earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up completely changing my life. At the time, I was like studying literature and I was a waitress. And uh, I ended up moving to Norway. Uh And I went to this um, anarchist art school called Strikjarna in Oslo. Oh, really? Okay. For two years. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, And then, um, you know, I went to San Francisco Art Institute. I did a year at Valand, spent some time at Stadelschule. So I kind of have this like long, you know, sort of art education but it's it's funny because i I know mark spiegler now uh pretty well who's the ceo of art basel and sometimes he gets mad at me for things that i say and i'm always like mark you can't get mad at me art basel created me like (laughs) i am your child like (laughs) and uh i don't know i think like i think pretty much everyone no one can no one can like properly get too mad at me for too long in the art world because I'm just uh, I'm just like st- stating the obvious. Mm-hmm. I'm just stating mm-hmm. the you know my my tagline is that I'm at the cutting edge of stating the obvious. I'm not really like when I started doing the account, making the memes and starting the account. I, I was really surprised that I got so many followers and so many people were like into it because uh, I thought that like everybody, like I thought it was like open information, like how insane the art market actually is and the way the art world functions. Um, But it turns out, I guess that like nobody had been talking about it. Hmm. Um, which is why I think it got pop so popular. 
amazing backstory. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> there's so many kind of uh, thoughts popping up, popping up in my mind here. But um, why, why is there not so much fun and, and comedy and, and laughter? And why is the art world so strict? And, and uh, why do you think that is? I mean, you could see say a little bit the same about fashion. Yeah, well, there's one like very simple answer that I can elaborate on. But essentially, the, the answer is money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like my, people don't, people don't laugh when you fuck around with their money. Mm, mm, true. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, so the art, you know, the, the art world is a, is one of the last unregulated industries in the world. Um, and no one can actually say how much money is in this industry because there is a sector of people who buy art to um, wash money and hide Mm -hmm. money so and you know like if you think about certain things that are in museums for example like their collections are priceless and there are there are basically collectors at certain levels that have essentially priceless collections. Mm. Um, there's so much money and everybody is there for their piece of the pie. And that's also why, especially in this particular art world, cause I know there's many, so I don't wanna like say that this is the only art world, but in the art world of, you know, galleries and then mm. galleries that go to all these fairs, they're spending substantial funds to even be there. So they're going to take the safest and surest bet that they'll be able to sell whatever these things are um, for the highest price that they possibly can. And a lot of people who buy art don't just buy art because they like art. They buy art because they are speculating on it Hmm. like a lot of people do with other parts of their financial portfolio. So when I walk into an art booth, let's say, pretend, you know, and I want to spend $35,000, but I want that to grow to $250,000 over the next five years. You want to make sure you're working with somebody who is incredibly serious about placing all of the, this artist's works into the right collections. Mm-hmm. And um, you want to make sure that some of these works are going into museums because museums raise the value of the work. Um, so there's like sort of all these rules and there's a lot of like decorum and there's a lot of like, who is and is not allowed to buy there, you know, they do, a, they do extensive basically like background checks and not like, you know, not like a police background mm. check, but what they want to know is like, is this person really as, you know, wealthy as they mm. portray themselves to be? Are they an art flipper? Are they building a collection of note? Like what's their, what's their motivation? And so, it's, it's one of the few sort of shopping environments, if you can call it that, where it's actually the seller that has more control than the mm. potential buyer. Mm. Um, you're more likely to hear no than you are to hear yes in a lot of these situations. And the reason for that is, again, <clears throat> because you're, we're, we're talking about these markets that are being created in real time and um in order to do that you you know it's uh well it's it's sort of like a ponzi scheme you know to a certain Mm -hmm. extent Mm -hmm. you know everybody gets in on it the right people buy it the right people have it etc etc suddenly it becomes worth a lot finally your non-resale you know contract runs out somebody runs and puts it at auction that work that, you know, I have a friend who sold a work 
in uh, I was there. I saw the work. I think it was uh, 2000, uh, 2011, 2012 at NADA. She sold a work for $4,750. And just uh, this last year at Sotheby's, it sold for $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. So how you go from $4,000 to $1.5 million. And then that means that that artist has to raise their prices mm -hmm. in order to make sure that their secondary market isn't falling behind their uh, primary, mm -hmm. or sorry, their primary market isn't mm -hmm. falling behind their secondary market. So, <clears throat> so then it becomes even harder to get the work and they want to make sure even more special people have it. And this is how they sort of create these, I wouldn't say they're fake markets, but they're, they're, they're creating value. Basically these, these artists paintings are the, the currency and the gallery functions a lot like a brokerage or a hedge fund, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's uh it's very serious and i you know I, I i just wrote an article that i sent you and that anybody who's listening is welcome to read mm -hmm. on my website larrysaltz.com called uh, millionaires mall and we sort of i sort of break it down for everyone about like exactly what's going on um and i spend a lot of time writing in general um helping people who like otherwise would maybe, you know, walk into a situation and not fully understand what's going on and think like, well, why can't I just buy that? Or why, why do I feel so excluded or mm. whatever? And, and the bottom line is it's, it's an exclusionary market. Mm -hmm. Even if you're rich, like, even if you're rich, like we, you know, we have a lot of like tech money trying to come into the art world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times um, because people don't trust uh, tech people uh, and they're assuming that they're just there to speculate, uh, they won't sell to them. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just it's it's very interesting. I think in uh, the region where I live, Scandinavia or Sweden in particular, there's so many tech billionaires, so you can't exclude them from the market. <laughs> there's so many. Um, but you're right. Yeah, it's interesting. When I talk to my dealer friends, I mean, they, they try to um, explain the system in a nice way. But then on the other hand, as you say, I mean, there's so many hidden rules and uh, yeah, there's so much ongoing mm -hmm. behind the scenes, which I will never see because I, I don't have the right money or the right collection or the right network to, to get mm -hmm. the full access. Right. But I'm just curious. Um, what is your role then in the in the art market, uh, given these circumstances? And I mean, you, you said you started this account on Instagram three and a half years ago. And now you have, um, I think, I mean, when, when you started, I, I, I mean, it felt very liberating. First of all, I, I need to say that it still feels liberating to, to kind of follow mm -hmm. you online. Mm -hmm. But then you also started to produce these reports. And, you know, it, it felt like you, you, you developed the whole kind of platform. But let's start with the first question. Yeah. So what's your role in, in the art market? Well, I'm just going to back up and say that I'm an artist who the reason I can make fun of everyone in the art world is because when I came out of art school, I thought that um, I was just going to like move to New York and be an artist. And mm. like, <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't, I didn't understand. They don't teach you in art school because it's considered, you know, crass and they want mm. you to, just focus on art making so they don't teach you anything about the business side which is incredibly negligent especially in a place like america where you got to make money to survive or you end up mm. on the streets you know mm. there's absolutely absolutely no social net to catch you <clears throat> so i came to new york and um i had a million jobs. I was like a nanny. I was a waitress. I was a personal assistant. So I, I was all these things. But I was living up in Harlem in this decrepit, but very large 2000 square foot um, apartment that hadn't been renovated since 1973. And I lived there alone. I got this deal. I was paying like $500 a month. And so at the time, one of my many jobs, I was interning at galleries 
and working at galleries, but uh, interning. And I realized that I thought it was really fun to work with my friends and my peers. And I thought it was really fun to put on exhibitions. So all of a sudden I sort of became a curator um, and we had our first show called Nothing Ever Happened. And um, I let these artists basically use my house like an artist residency. And I just slept on a blow up mattress mm -hmm. and they took it over. But what was funny, and I don't know if it was like the way I dressed at the time or the fact that I'm, you know, articulate and uh, overly art educated is that suddenly my friends were treating me and trusting me like I was their art dealer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and suddenly I, I fell into that role and I started selling art and I didn't, I mean, I never ever thought I would do that. Um, I want, I personally wanted to be an artist, but th this was just the path at the time. What kind of art did you do? No, I was always conceptual art. Always which, conceptual. Uh, always I don't know okay. if you know, there's, there's not, there's not really a market for conceptual art. <laughs> well, maybe there is now with Jerry, but there definitely wasn't at the time. Mm. Um, again, total naivete coming out of school thinking that like, oh, you just get out of school and like a mm. gal. I don't know. I thought like, a gallery pays you and then you make art. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. You need to get um, state funding. Or and so, something like that. yeah, I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I was thinking. I was also very irresponsible, <laughs> but, um, I like fell into this role of curating and art dealing. And then uh, I had a very kind of strange miracle happen, which was that a childhood friend of mine who I'd been mentoring on the side about art had asked me or had come to me and basically said, you know, I've done the math about how much an MFA and a BFA cost. And he's very fortunate and comes from a good background. He said, I've done the math on what that costs. And I actually think I would just learn more if I took that money and I invested that in you to open an art gallery. <laughs> so I couldn't say no to that, obviously. So I went and I opened uh, a gallery in Los Angeles and we so sold showed and sold emerging contemporary art which is like a loser's game because what you're basically doing is spending all the money and the time to prime these artists that are going to just mm. get taken by bigger richer galleries as soon as mm -hmm. like sort of you have vetted them and gotten them to a certain point mm -hmm. but because money wasn't necessarily like the main issue, the main point of the gallery, mm. I um, got to put on incredibly ambitious exhibitions, work with amazing artists from around the world. Um, and I curated every single exhibition for two years. I wrote everything. I kind of considered myself an invisible artist within it because I worked so hard on each one. I even let artists come and live with me in my bedroom for a while because, you know, like we were just anything to get these shows going. And the gallery had an amazing cult following. Um, and we were selling, but like you just, if you just do the math on like how much an emerging uh, piece of artwork costs, the volume at which you have to sell, not only to operationally keep a gallery open, but then to even begin to think about paying yourself is mm. like crazy. Yeah. So we were doing okay. We didn't, we didn't go out of business or anything, but again, my path was, this was not my path. This was not meant mm. for me. So in 2018, I got very sick. At very unexpectedly, like extremely unexpectedly. And it was very scary for a moment. I went blind. I went deaf. I couldn't use my hands. Mm. I couldn't use my feet. It was like a very, very, it was an extreme illness. What was brought the on illness, by this may disease I ask? called typhus. It's called typhus rickettsia. 
Okay. It's um it it's something from a tick bite mm-hmm. from being out in the woods. And my uh my business partner or at the time, you know, I mean I couldn't do anything. I, for for a long time, even after I got out of the hospital, I had like just tunnel vision in one eye. Mm-hmm. And I remember being like this, trying to like do deals, like <laughs> closing one eye, one eye open, like trying to sell a painting on my mm-hmm. phone. It was just like not working. And he, so my business partner came to me and said, listen, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you that we're done now here. Mm-hmm. Like this is over and you're going to go home to your parents and you're going to get better. And I felt at the time like somebody was like taking my child away from me. Mm-hmm. I was so heartbroken and sad because I had put everything into it. And I was 33. I felt like a loser moving home to my parents' house. Mm-hmm. Like, really? I'm, I'm starting there mm-hmm. again, you know? And can I ask uh, you, where, where I, were so, you, where were you from originally? I mean, where? Your parents, where where do they live? I mean, where did you end up then? I'll tell you where my parents live, but I where I'm from is another story. Okay. Uh, my yes. parent, my mom, and my my mom and my stepdad live in a suburb of Miami called okay. Coral Springs. Okay. So, let's say I wasn't moving back to the culture capital of the world. No. Mm. <laughs> you know, and I had no friends. You know, I was 33. I'd, mm. I'd left home a long time ago. And so um, I was laying in bed and I was in bed uh, probably like 22 hours a day. Mm. Uh, and that is when, uh, you know, 2018, like memes were not ubiquitous yet. It was sort of, I only knew of memes as this thing like that, like, Late, like I knew like 13 year old boys were making them and like sharing them on mm. these like sort of absurdist meme accounts. Mm. And I thought I, I have like truly like the sense of humor of a 13 year old boy. So mm. for me, like that was like really a great space for me to like play around. But I started realizing that like all these memes, I was like, I could just like, move a few of these words around and like this would just be about the art world Mm -hmm. and so then i started making memes and then the memes which were anonymous were one thing but then i was outed in the press as being jerry gagosian Mm -hmm. after about a year and a half of Mm -hmm. doing it anonymously and when i was anonymous Everybody in the art world was paranoid. No one knew who was doing it. So, and nobody knew it was me. Mm-hmm. So, I remember like, that, actually. There was a lot of debate who you were and, you know, who's behind yeah. your account. And so I used to get, like, the most incredible privileged information because everyone's, like, trying to fuck everyone else over. <laughs> you know, internal documents from galleries, from auction houses, contracts, resale contracts like I was getting like all this stuff like people were just like giving it to me I loved being anonymous but then I was outed and I I came to this fork in the road of okay either I'm gonna stop it now because I'm outed what's the point or I'm gonna like lean into this and just like let it let it be and that was I think ultimately the right decision because what has since come from that is now I, because the original question is where do I sit in the art world Mm -hmm. now? Now, not only do I, you know, still make memes, I write extensively about the art world. Um, I make art again, Mm -hmm. which is really fun. Um, And I still curate exhibitions. Mm -hmm which is really fun. Um, I just did a massive project during Freeze Mm -hmm. um, with an artist named Hiba Shabazz. And, uh, you know, the next step is um, I'm working on a TV show. Mm, So Mm. it's, it's sort of like, I know that, you know, 
people always make fun of millennials like oh you're my multi hyphenates like <laughs> you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this i didn't have a choice though this is like this was the way that the, that life pushed me mm -hmm. you know into doing all of these things and to a certain extent it's been amazing because i've realized that like i'm very good at writing about art mm -hmm. and i'm very good at writing about art in a way that people who are not just the insiders can understand mm -hmm. which is important for me because i do believe that art should be for everyone mm -hmm. and that this sort of obnoxious over art speaky let me show off all the big words that i know way of describing art what it does is it just alienates people who of course can understand art and who of course should be a part of art because it's their cultural right it's mm -hmm. their cultural inheritance too to know about their art world and so it's been a lot of fun because we you know not only my audience isn't just artists curators and other dealers um first of all i people write to me all the time they're like i've learned how to become an art collector because of you which is kind of cool mm -hmm. um and then there's other people who are like oh i just had always liked art but thought i was too dumb to understand and now i can read what you write and mm -hmm. i totally get it and it's super interesting mm -hmm. and i'm like yeah it is super interesting so um, I think I'm just, a, I'm a little bit of a translator for people. I can still, I can still write inside baseball. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there's inside baseball embedded in what I'm writing, but I can write things generally that just mm -hmm. help paint a picture. And I think it's obnoxious when people in the, uh, especially in the art world we're famous for this this is why this cliche exists that like oh you know like that we're cold and we're rude and we're arrogant and we act like we know it all mm -hmm. and we're frivolous and all these different things and, and for me and my friends and a lot of people i know we're not like that so there needed to be a new voice there needed to be a shift away from like talking and writing about art as if it were back in the middle ages mm -hmm. when no one could read the pope you know or the you know whatever you call it in the catholic religion mm -hmm. would read mass in latin mm -hmm. and then somebody invented the printing press mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden protestantism came out of mm -hmm. this idea of oh wait i can read and interpret the bible myself I don't, I don't need to pay a priest to interpret and tell me anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that with people like who write and talk about art like me, in combination with something as democratizing as, I mean, there's a lot of bad with social media, but Instagram and art have been very good for each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Suddenly now there's all these people that love art and want to be a part of the art world and have an affinity for these things that otherwise would have never come to it because it was purposefully sort of mm -hmm. kept out of their um milieu yeah no but that's um that's a good observation of the art world and thank you for sharing so much of your your thoughts on the art world but i'm just still a bit curious um so when when you launched this, uh, I mean the Jerry Gugosian um, account. I mean, as you say, you were anonymous for a couple of years. Then you were outed, um, and and you said that maybe some things changed when you were outed. It gave you maybe a bigger platform mm -hmm. to work from as a as a person, right, as an individual. Um, mm -hmm. But how much or not did you think the Jerry Gugosian kind of if you take the Instagram account specifically, I mean, how much or not did you lose uh, on being out there? And did you, I mean, as you said before, you were given a lot of insider 
news and you know there, there was um there were a lot of advantages being anonymous right so what yeah i mean just curious about uh, that shift and how much or not that impacted let's say I'm just, content when when i was first outed i thought that i i thought that i lost something in hindsight two years later i've only gained in the sense that you know a lot of the people that in so in the art world we have these crazy hierarchies and it's very funny because it's like i don't if you compared it to like hollywood or fashion you'd be like that little nerdy man over there is like the whole reason everyone's here and excited you know like mm -hmm. <laughs> but but there's like incredible hierarchies within the art world and first of all i would say for my general audience who's maybe not participating in the art world hierarchy or are lower on the art world hierarchy um they were very excited to put a, a name to mm -hmm. a face and i have a lot of people who i know are extremely attached to me as sort of a, a symbol especially because i'm a woman and so many people thought i was a man for so mm -hmm. long so um i know that there's a lot of pride amongst women in the art world that jerry Zagosian is a woman um and then you know in terms of let's say some of the like how you know quote unquote powerful people mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not getting like crazy internal. I mean, I still, I still do get some screenshots and stuff. I'm not getting it with the same amount of frequency that I used to get, but what I'm getting in place of those things, which I think is very interesting and your audience is free to judge me on this. However they like, which is I'm getting incredible opportunities to actually work with people who are at the highest level in the mm -hmm. art world. So for example, I'm doing, um, I'm curating an, an exhibition at Sotheby's um, and I've worked it out. I've worked out a special deal with them because I want the artists to get more money than they normally would. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, whatever. And I'm finding artists for this exhibition that would maybe not necessarily be getting the attention that they normally would either. So like, I would have never had that opportunity mm -hmm. before if I was anonymous. Um, another thing, you know, I'm working on this uh, t television series and one of the, you know, there's only, there's only four of them, so you can guess which one, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna say who one of the biggest mega dealers in the world mm -hmm. is like helping me make my TV show. Mm. And it's literally said, come in, make fun of us, show the inner workings of the gallery, um, but show the beauty too, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. has a sense of humor about it. Um, because that's a question actually, how, how much of a risk is it that you get so immersed now into this system that you initially kind of um, critiqued? How much of a risk is that at, along the way you you kind of um, gradually without knowing it lose your integrity and then you're, you're kind of losing sight of what Jerry Gagosian was initially about if a person's going to lose their integrity that can be in any industry it, it mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't really matter um I had a gallery for two years and I had integrity with every exhibition and every mm -hmm. artist I ever worked with um when I conduct business, uh, first of all, I avoid, I actually avoid art dealing now. People mm -hmm. ask me a lot to do it. I will curate exhibitions and set parameters for how deals should be structured to protect the artist mm -hmm. because I'm very sensitive to that. Um, for example, I just curated an exhibition at Almin Rech, but I did not mm -hmm. want to be a part of the sales process mm -hmm. whatsoever. Um, I just, uh, commissioned a massive 
portrait of 11 of the most prominent female um, figurative and neo-surrealist painters in New York into th this one big painting that Hiba Shabazz painted. Mm -hmm. And we sold the painting, but the, the selling of the painting had rules. One being that it had to be 100% donated to a museum in New York. Mm -hmm. And the other parameter is that the other half of, so the artist gets her cut because mm -hmm. she made the painting, but the cut that normally I would take as the dealer, I'm foregoing that and instead setting up a fund to support an emerging artist in 2023 to be able to have a studio. Mm, that's so fantastic. Yeah. in each one of my projects, I'm, you know, keenly aware of, I know exactly who and what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And there's good guys in the art world too. And there's a lot of, but there's also a lot of bad guys. Mm -hmm. So you just need to know the rules of the game. And then I know that they would, that people want to work with me because I'm popular right now. You know, that could change. But right now I'm popular, so everyone wants to work with me, which is great. But if they do, then they're going to have to play by certain rules that I set up. And I'm, I'm an artist first type of person mm -hmm. because I think the artists are the most vulnerable ones in the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not worried about the rich collectors. I'm not worried about the rich dealers, but I am worried about the artists and uh, their careers and how their work will be treated and whether or not it'll end up at auction in six months, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. um so I only sell art now under very like specific uh, conditions. Um, but the television series that I that I'm working on, mm. well, I'm working on two, but the the main one that I want to do is I I want to be kind of like the Anthony Bourdain of the art world, mm -hmm. and I just want to show the rest of the world why because art world is art is mainstream at this point like it's it's not niche it's at least in the united states and i think because of social media mm -hmm. art isn't really niche anymore um and so it's time for somebody to uh who is educated in the art but also comes from a place of like i'm not gonna bullshit you and mm -hmm. talk down to you i'm just gonna show you what this is and do it with a little bit of humor that's sort of the goal of the show. Mm -hmm. And is that so, Hilde who does the show, know, or is it uh, the Jerry Gagosian? No, it'll be it'll be Jerry. Okay, always. Jerry is very much. I, I I guess I have to say this at this point. Jerry is a written character. Mm -hmm. Like that is not my personality. Mm -hmm. That's like I'm I'm actually in social settings. I'm actually very shy. Um, and I'm just, I just listen. I listen to what everyone says and I'm really observant. Mm -hmm. And I have this document called words and phrases mm -hmm. that I have been keeping for years. And I just listen to how people word things. And then I'm able to sort of write in that character. But that's hmm. very, the you know, Hildy is like a very earnest, like cuddly, loving, loving, you know, sort of quiet, very like private person, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there, I'm definitely learning to deal with that because I am, it's, and this is how you know art, the art world is not niche mm -hmm. anymore, is, is that people like me are getting paid to make public appearances mm -hmm. and throw parties and do this and do that. And I'm getting used to um, people sort of like thinking they can just touch me because they feel mm -hmm. like they know me or, mm -hmm. um, you know, like running up to me and telling me overly personal things about themselves and their art. And I'm like, 
whoa, 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 like, mm. hello, <laughs> I, I don't know you, <laughs> you know, not in a mean way, but just, mm. you know. So how much of Hildi so am I experiencing in this conversation? You're talking to you're talking to me. I mean, I was mm. I was teasing you earlier when yeah, I no, said that. Um, but I but Jerry Gagosian is a character that you know, I don't have dual personalities, not, but <laughs> it's it's sort of like acting, and it's something that I'm able to sort of snap into. My mm. my boyfriend, my boyfriend always laughs. He's like, "Okay, now be Jerry," and then like <laughs> I can just. But listen, I mean, it's so easy to criticize the art world, um, but what's great about the art world, uh, especially this kind of blue chip art world that we're talking about? I'm, I can only speak for myself. So I just went to the Venice Biennale, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of your listeners know what that is or they've been themselves. And I went and I was extremely disappointed. I thought that the exhibition that the curator Cecilia Alamane had created in the main pavilion mm -hmm. was um, dystopic, disheartening, depressing. I thought there was a lot of mourning happening, a lot of expressions of pain. But then if you read the exhibition literature, which I read over and over and over again because I had to write about it. She tried to sit, to make an argument for new worlds, for new parallel worlds where things could be better. And there was none of that happening in that exhibition. Hmm. It was, if anything, it was a mausoleum of sadness. And I'm very sensitive to art. So I, I cried a lot, not there, but, you know, at my hotel, trying to figure it out. I also felt very uncomfortable, like uh, going to party, you know, big parties where there's images of, uh, you know, sub-Saharan African refugees mm. with 11 inch knife blade scars on their faces being projected on golden walls mm. while everybody's eating uh, you know, little bites of this and that mm. and drinking uh, Aperol spritzes and not even looking at the art. I mean, I was just like, this is dystopic. This is fucked up. Mm. So I went back home to Los Angeles and I kind of had a few days where I was crying and feeling bad. And then I decided I needed to self-soothe myself self-soothe yeah mm. and um and i didn't know how that was going to be and then all of a sudden i got this vision in my um head of a painting because neo surreal and oh and by the way the venice biennale was supposed to be about surrealism mm -hmm. but i was like thinking about you know all the neo surrealist painters in New York that are really leading the charge right now mm -hmm. and all the figurative painters that are really leading the charge right now. And they're all women. And they're actually all women that I know because I, these are my peers, you know, mm -hmm. I'm 36. Mm -hmm. This is the age when it's happening. And, um, and I thought, Oh my God, fuck that shitty show. Sorry if I'm cursing. I don't no, know if no, cursing is on your show. But uh, like that show was terrible. Like why? And, and I was thinking there needs to be this painting that exists that has all these women who are alive, who are vibrant and full of life and joie de vivre in spite of the fact that we all just went through a global pandemic, in spite of the fact that America right now, I mean, I don't know if you have paid attention to the violence mm -hmm. that is like pervasive everywhere massive homelessness there's you know ma massive inflation like all these things i still know these women that persevere and are making these incredible things and really leading a movement in contemporary art right now so i was obsessing over this idea i need to have a painting of all of them and and then hibba shabazz just happened to be in my neighborhood she lives in new york mm -hmm. And she happened to be in my neighborhood in LA. 
And she was like, oh, should I come by for some coffee or tea? I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. please. Like, I was just going to like probably bitch and cry to her some more. <laughs> and I started telling her about this painting that I thought needed to exist. And without even asking her, she just volunteered to make it. And, and she, you know, and, and then this, it was this massive undertaking to make sure that we represented all kinds of women and the, and the right ones. And that it was, there was a spectrum in age and all these things. And then to find the ones that wanted to be a part and that, because a lot of them were actually really shy because they don't paint themselves. They paint other people and other Mm -hmm. things. And so it was just, it became this like beautiful, cathartic project to get this painting to come into existence and then and work with Hiba every day as she's painting it and, and getting all the artists together and then to it ended up being I don't I know that you guys are in centimeters so I don't know if you know but like it ended up being like 90 by eight, 90 inches by mm-hmm. 80 inches mm-hmm, mm-hmm very large work on paper, mm-hmm. water, watercolor, gouache. And then we erected it on the top, this literally like, you know, the glass ceiling, this, they say this mm-hmm. the saying, like breaking the glass ceiling for women. We, it, we hung it from this glass atrium in this light filled room mm-hmm. during freeze. And you know, hundreds and hundreds of people saw it. And um, those women felt incredibly honored. And we got to document a moment in art history. And it that that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I mean, it's not like that every day. And it, it was incredibly hard work. I mean, it, it's not just like I said, Oh, I want this painting. And that's call me when it's done it was it was a personal massive undertaking to get Mm -hmm. this thing to come into life and you know i had to i worked with um matches fashion which is a british fashion company Mm -hmm. who had asked me you know if i wanted to throw a party and i i had to convince them actually i'd rather redirect the funds Mm -hmm. of a party into like commissioning this painting so you know, it's it's a victory like that, or it's a moment like that, where then I'm I'm not just working with Hiba, I'm also working with eleven amazing artists to get this thing to come into mm. existence. Like that felt pretty great, and then to see people's reactions to it, and not just people from the art world, to to meet an old lady who older lady who you know just like you know telling me I can feel them, I feel their strength. I remember that feeling myself, you know, like just, it was so, and seeing children react to it and see, then you're, then you feel like, okay, art can do amazing things, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's not always totally ugly or like I, (laughs) you know, I call myself an art patron in some ways, but I'm not like a money art patron. I'm an art patron in the sense that I come up with, really crafty ideas for how we can like get art in front of lots of people you know and i'm i'm good at that and i know a lot of rich people Mm. so if i come up with a good enough idea and if i find the right artist you know a lot of times i can convince people to get on the train and and i'm lucky Mm. i'm i'm it's not lucky i work hard i work hard to be able to do this you know nurture relationships on both sides because i'm not just i have to nurture the relationship of the art with the art real art patron the one with the money and i have to nurture the relationship with the artists in order for these projects to come into existence so where do you see um yourself in i mean i don't know in a decade or two i mean what do you think would ha- will have happened to uh, i mean the jerry gogosian kind of platform, but also yourself. I mean, to Hilda, where do you see yourself in 10 to 20 years? I will say that, you know, I think something that is a little, I lived in Sweden. I think I told you that I lived in Sweden two different times. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and so I'm very familiar and technically I'm half Swedish so um so on which side your mother's or father's or? my my mom on your mom's side okay. but we like we, my family was so poor that they moved to Denmark so there's like this <laughs> okay. controversy it's not a real controversy in my family where they're like we're Danish and then the other side's like no we're not really Danish we're actually Swedish like, oh. and, w- and when was this uh, by the way how, how long time ago was this so my family was uh uh from Skåne uh-huh. and this was in the 19 1912 yeah okay something but like that fairly recent they were I mean, very it's... poor yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah recent no but, but no you know but, my, I mean. but the way it works in no but there's the way it works in america i and i don't know if people in sweden realize this we have more swedes in america than you guys do in sweden and yeah, the same probably. with norwegians which I'm, <laughs> I'm half i'm half norwegian mm. I'm half Norwegian as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's funny because where my family immigrated to, which is like North Dakota, this like mm-hmm. crazy state up at the top of America, because they could farm in cold regions. That's why they were mm-hmm. able to come over on the Homestead Act. Um, the, the the funny thing is, is that uh, they kept speaking like old Norwegian and mm-hmm. old Swedish and so there's like sayings in my family that are like normal, you know, because and my grandmother still speaks Norwegian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then like when I moved to Norway or Sweden and I would like go to say some of those things, mm-hmm. like my friends would make fun of me and they were like, <laughs> uh, nobody talks like that here anymore. Do you have any examples? <laughs> well, I know. Well, first of all, just my grandmother spoke Norwegian on the phone mm-hmm. to one of my Norwegian friends and she was mm-hmm. like wow that sounded like a storybook from like <laughs> the 1800s and I'm like yeah well that's kind of like but I w- we have we had this thing that I mm-hmm. thought everybody says um this is so embarrassing I I thought so we have this cheers in my family like holidays parties whatever we say uh skål for fiske mm-hmm. okay, and so- cheers for fish yeah Um, yeah, exactly or for fishing or for yeah exactly yeah yeah so because my great grandfather would farm put everything in the ground and then while everything was growing my great grandmother with with my name Hilda Mm -hmm. would stay with the farm and he would go and he would fish Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was always a cheers for fish but I didn't know that that was just like <laughs> only for your family if your family was fishermen. <laughs> so funny. So like when I moved to Scandinavia, I would <laughs> say it and people would be like, why are you cheersing for fish? <laughs> but oh, um, all this to say is that I, I know and understand uh, the culture pretty, pretty well, probably mm-hmm. better than most Americans do because I lived there for about six I lived in Scandinavia for like six years um and I think all my friends that live in Scandinavia that are my age have kids Mm -hmm. have partners maybe they're not married but they have partners um you know probably buying an apartment bought an apartment already like maybe a little cottage second home whatever um We've had, as an American, and some, you know, we've had such a hard time in the last couple of years, and the millennial generation in particular in the United States. Um, There's huge swaths of this generation that are like not plan, not planning on having kids. Um, I know a lot, a lot of people are not getting married anymore, which I know in Scandinavia, people don't get married, but in America, that used to be very normal Mm -hmm. to get married. A lot of people are not getting married. Um, Home ownership, even if you're a millionaire is like almost impossible Mm -hmm. because it's like it, it, unless you move way outside of a city or whatever, it's, it's so exorbitantly expensive because um people like flip houses here kind of mm-hmm. like they flip art you know people just buy buy up and and then it becomes impossible or, or like airbnbs like the city is like half airbnb mm-hmm. so it's like empty and, but people who actually live here can't rent or buy 
So, um, you know, so like home ownership is down for the millennial generation. Also, a lot of uh, millennials, you know, don't have full time jobs. They have lots of part time jobs. Mm -hmm. And that also means they don't have health insurance or they have like really bad, like government subsidized, like Obamacare mm -hmm. health insurance, which is like bad. Um, so basically I'm not trying to be depressing or anything. I'm just trying to say that the idea of people in my generation in the United States trying to decide, trying to see where we'll be in 10 or 20 years because of the way things have been going is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of sad because it's like, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be this way. Like it just shouldn't be this way. Um, I know that I'm probably going to still be in the art world. Most likely because I love art um, and hopefully I'll just be like a really famous, you know, I'm the Anthony Bourdain of the art world, <laughs> Jerry Gagosian um, person who you know on TV and who takes you around on wild adventures. Um, but it, yeah, it's very hard to say. I've actually like, I've, I've actually like looked into like, 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 would a Scandinavian country accept me? Like, <laughs> can I move back there? I hate You're your winters, welcome. but like, <laughs> no, but to get the visa, but like you're, you're, you know, it's, it's, um, it's super interesting because you guys are like my girlfriend from Sweden was just, was just here a few days ago. Mm -hmm. She's like my age. She has three children, a thriving psychology practice owns a home, like, you know, all these things. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, you know, it's really, we've just had such a rough time. We've, we've had one thing after another happen here. And I think it's, it's not that Americans are nihilistic per se, young Americans are nihilistic, but I don't think that we're making plans that far in the future because being hyper vigilant of right mm -hmm. now is sadly the absolute necessity. Hmm. So I think actually we have to uh, wrap up soon here. I mean, we could, I could go on for for many more hours. There's so many topics we have not yet even touched upon. I think you know when you and I had our email conversation <sighs> prior to this recording, I listed a, a lot of questions I have not even asked you. Um. But I think, uh, you know, it's been a very personal conversation, to be honest. I, I'm um, very happy that you have shared so much about your view on the art world, but also mm. about you, yourself, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would like maybe to um, agree to meet again, do a follow up episode in a couple of months time, maybe, or, you know, then continue yeah. to um, continue this conversation. You know what you should do, actually, not to tell you what to do. You should call me when I'm in Art Basel in Switzerland. Mm, of course, yeah. I'll have that. I'll have some I'll have some funny stuff to say. I'll be like in the belly of the beast, mm -hmm. like with snake fighting with snakes, you know. <laughs> and then um, and then you'll like real. Then I'll have I'll have stuff to like. I'll be more critical. This was more like mm -hmm. me telling you who I am. <laughs> Wow, so that was a fascinating episode, both very personal but also insightful. Thank you for listening to this very special episode featuring Jerry Gogosian. This was Konst, a podcast by Scandinavian Mind, where we talk about contemporary and future art, its interconnection with society, culture, technology, finance and lifestyle. My name is Roland Philipp Kretschmar and hope you will get back to a future episode where we do a follow-up with Jerry, but also to any other future episode of Const. Thank you. Bye.